Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. When I was invited to come here about a year ago, I thought I should uh, share with you some thoughts. Is that yours? Share with you some thoughts about um, uh, aspects of rule of law. But uh, I also thought that uh, the subject needed a twist. So I was pondering what could the twist be, and there was one common denominator between Sweden and Australia, and that was Julian Assange. I thought that might caught a little bit of interest. Little did I know. Uh, at that time, I really thought that uh, the case Assange, from a Swedish perspective, would be closed by now. As you know, it's not. But I've decided to go on uh, and, and talk about Julian Assange as the departing point of what is of really interest here, and that is some general legal issues. Julian Assange is, of course, a very well-known person, but nevertheless, I, I would like to give some details that I picked up from Wikipedia about him. <laughs> Where else? Uh, he was born 1971, he's still a young man. He is an Australian, Australian editor, activist, publisher, and journalist. He is best known as the editor-in-chief and founder of WikiLeaks, it says, which publishes submissions of secret information, news leaks, and classified information from anonymous sources and whistleblowers. He's known for his work with the WikiLeaks and making public appearances around the world speaking about freedom of the press, censorship, and investigative journalism, which is what we are going to talk about this uh, evening also. I talk about Assange because it is an intriguing case. And when I say case, it is for the that Assange has, from a Swedish perspective, become a case. The, the discussion about him uh, is in Sweden is not primarily about the freedom of press. It's not about the evil of censorship nor is it about any other aspect of the good of transparency does to society. The discussion about Assange in Sweden is mainly about the charges for sexual criminal offenses and about how Assange has managed to keep away from the Swedish police that, he want, that want to hear him on these charges. It is also about the asylum at the embassy of Ecuador, but it, it also further about what the prosecutor, why the prosecutor cannot come uh, to hear Assange in London, and about why we have this costly and burdensome stalemate that you all know about. I will try to report objectively. I do that as a trained Swedish, legally trained Swedish spectator. I will, however, also venture some opinions, not about Assange as an individual, nor about any controversial aspect of the pending or possible court cases regarding him, but rather on some general issues that the Swedish Assange case brings up, issues that I think are worth to discuss and on which you can have or may have different opinions. That includes the hot subject to what extent sexual intimidation should be regarded as a crime, because that's what focus uh, is on in Sweden. But also, and perhaps of more relevance here today, uh, I will touch upon some of the fundamental values and principles that relate to the rule of law and the good of a transparent society. What good and what bad do leakages do to state secrets, leakages of state secrets do to society? And I will end by putting us all a question has justice a price? There is a other starting point which relates uh, to this, and that is about Bradley Manning. Out of internet sources, the following may be summarized. Private Manning, he was born in 1987, and in early 
2010, he was an unhappy United States Army soldier in Iraq. Assigned to an army unit based near Baghdad, he had access to databases used by United States government to transmit classified information. For some reason, he downloaded material from the databases and passed it to WikiLeaks. The material included some videos on airstrikes in Afghanistan and a huge amount of diplomatic documents and army reports. It was the largest set of restricted documents ever leaked to the public. Much of it was published by WikiLeaks or its media partners between April and November 2010. We all, I think, remember with horror the videos. As it seems, innocent people were shot at pleasure from a helicopter. Manning was arrested in May 2010 on suspicion of having passed classified material to the website WikiLeaks. He was charged with a number of offenses, including communicating national defense information to an authorized source and aiding the enemy, a capital offense, though the prosecutors said they would not seek the death penalty. The trial is expected to begin in June this year. As regards Assange, it has been reported that the United States Department of Justice has considered to prosecute him for several offenses. However, to my knowledge, and uh, that is based on internet information only, no formal charges have as yet been made. Now about the Swedish connection. Assange visited Sweden three times in 2010. The third time was in August, when he was invited by the Brotherhood Movement to hold a lecture and lead a following seminar on a Saturday, the 14th of uh, August. The movement is a Christian section of the Swedish Social Democrat Party. Anna, she worked as a press and political secretary for the movement, and she was involved in organizing the seminar. Anna would be out of town the days before the seminar, until the day of the seminar, so she let her flat to Assange. But Anna returned to Stockholm already Friday, a day before the seminar, uh, since she had a lot of work to do for the seminar. Anna and Assange had been in contact via email and telephone before, but they had never met personally. Nevertheless, they did agree that Assange, despite her coming home a day early, would go on living in Anna's department. Friday evening, this is the day when Anna came home, Assange and Anna went out to dinner together. Afterwards, they went back to Anna's flat and drank tea. The day after, Saturday, the seminar was held at 10 o'clock as planned. A lot of journalists attended, and so did Sophia, known by nobody but not unnoticed. She was young, well-built, and dressed in shocking pink. Sophia had taken an interest in Assange from what had been reported of him in the media, so, and she offered to help him out with the seminar. When Assange, just before the lecture was about to start, noted that they missed a cable for his computer, Sophia volunteered to buy one in a nearby shop. After the seminar, Sophia stayed around, and somehow she was invited to the lounge together with Assange and some prominent people. She happened to be seated next to him during the lunch. She did not take part in the discussion. She only asked Assange if the food tasted him, and he answered by feeding her a bit of it. Next Friday, almost a week later, Anna and Sophia went to the police together and made claims that Assange had sexually molested Sophia. Some hours later, Assange broke worldwide news of a new kind. He was arrested in absentia for sexual crimes. How do I know all this? I do not. But you can find the information on the internet. What I have accounted for is a comprehensive summary of leaked, classified Polish information. And I will explain in a moment how come. About the alleged crimes. Sophia and Anna did not know each other. They met at the seminar for the first time. Thereafter, they had no contact until Sophia emailed Anna on the Friday, the week after the seminar, and asked where she could find Assange. 
Anna von Sofia and the maid contact. Sofia told Anna the following. After the launch that Saturday, Sofia had accompanied Assange during the Saturday afternoon. Following a visit to Sidiba, they parted because Assange had other things to do, but they agreed to see each other again. Sophia was not able to get in touch with Assange during Sunday, the day after. However, the next Monday, they made contact over phone and via SMS and settled a meeting. They met in early evening. After having been around in the city for a while, they took the train out from Stockholm to a small suburban town where Sophia lived. The ride was for an hour. When arriving, Sophia suggested that they should take in at the hotel. Assange declined. He said he wanted to see girls in the natural habitat. Sophia therefore invited Assange to her apartment. They had sex. Assange used a condom. Not because he wanted it, he did not, and he had protested. But Sophia has demanded it. She did not have unprotected sex, and he had finally resigned. Afterwards, they fell asleep. She woke by feeling him penetrate her again. She immediately asked, are you wearing anything? And he answered, you. She told him, you better not have HIV. And he replied, of course not. She felt it was too late, and she let him continue. She had been nagging about condoms all night long. She would not be bothered to telling him again. Of course, we do not exactly know what Sophia told Anna, and we do not know what happened. What has been accounted for is Anna's narrative as recorded by the police according to the supposed to be secret police protocol that you can find on the internet. Sophia not only told a story to Anna, she also made clear that she intended to follow up the matter with the police. Anna decided to support Sophia, and as mentioned, they went to the police station together. Sophia was heard, as far as I can judge, according to the rules. That means inter alia that the interrogation is documented by a sound recorder. I have accounted for Sophia, Sophia's story. It seems that Anna did not think that she was a crime victim until the law was explained to her at the police office, by a police officer at the police station. Then she followed suit and also filed charges. Anna was heard the following day and she told the police the following. After having enjoyed the dinner that Friday when she came home, uh, they went back to Anna's apartment and drank tea. Assange showed interest in her by caressing her leg. She welcomed it, and then things happened fast. In a narrow bed, and with no clothes on, they had a struggle about condoms. Assange tried to add her without using one. She refused. They more or less had a physical fight about it, but eventually Assange gave in and accepted the condom Anna had got for him. Anna checked with her hand that he really had put the condom on. After a while, Assange withdrew from her to fix the condom. There was a noise. It sounded to Anna like Assange took the condom off. He penetrated it again. Anna once more checked with her hand and again felt the edge of the condom, where it should be, and so she let the sex continue. Afterwards, Anna discovered that the condom was broken. She was convicted that Assange, when he withdrew from her, deliberately broke it at the tip and thereafter continued the sex. Given Assange's rumor as chasing every woman who crosses his path, using a condom was very important to her. At least that was what she told the police. Again, we don't know what happened. We only know what Anna told the police. But that we know because it leaked. Now, how can we know this? How come this information leaked? A police investigation is under Swedish law supposed to be a matter of secrecy. And that, of course, on good grounds. An open investigation is, for obvious reasons, very often a poor investigation. Publicity would risk impairing the progress of the work in many respects. But clearly, a police investigation cannot be confidential forever. 
Thus, the content of an investigation becomes public after the investigation has been finalized. It can be concluded by the prosecutor closing the case or by bringing the case to the court for trial. If a police officer discloses any information about the investigation before that, he has committed a crime. Leakages in general are against the law and will be prosecuted. The Swedish criminal investigation as regards Assange has not been concluded yet. It is still ongoing and its contents should have stayed secret. How come then that we know about what Anna and Sofia told the police when nobody has been prosecuted for leakages? There has not even been an investigation of the matter. It has to do with the Swedish system as regards prosecution as regards protection of informers to the media. It has to do with something that we call source privilege. Under the laws of many countries, authorities, including the courts, cannot compel a journalist to reveal the identity of a source for a story. The thinking is that without a strong guarantee of anonymity, Many people will be deterred from coming forward and sharing information of public interest with journalists. If so, social problems such as corruption or other similar crimes might go undetected and unchallenged. The protection of sources is fundamental in any state that fully accepts the need of checks and balances as regards public author authorities and their representatives. It forms a tool to maintain high standards of an open, democracy, open democratic society committed to the rule of law. Modern technology has shown, though, that an informer is not sufficiently protected by silence of the journalist in question. And that has to do with the technical revolution. Electronic communication provide excellent means for an open and transparent society. With smartphones, you can com communicate not only by voice, but also by sending and receiving text and pictures, including documents. You can transmit the same message to thousands and thousands by just push a button. Where the information is assembled in a database, you can download it on a small memory stick and physically carry it with you. All this, of course, facilitate a protection against state repression and enhances transparency and democratic movements. But every coin has a flip side. And in this case, that is that the, the electronic communications are traceable. And so, of course, also between journalists and their sources. The method of communication provides governments with a tool to determine the origin of information. It has been reported that in the United States, federal government contends that electronic communications is not protected against such searches. I don't e do not even venture a guess as regards the situation in China. It is my suggestion that a journalist privilege and a duty not to reveal its sources is in today's society not enough to live up to the purpose or the principle of source confidentiality. And I believe that the Swedish way to deal with the matter could be of some interest in this respect. In Sweden, the legislator has its long gone a step further than to a mere journalist privilege when it comes to the protection of sources. The source is in itself under, protect, under the constitution protected Firstly, it is a crime to search for the source. It's even a crime to search for the source. And secondly, sourcing a journalist cannot be prosecuted, even if the informant is under a duty to keep secret the information. That is what I mean by a source privilege. This explains how come what Anna and Sophia told the police immediately leaked to the media. What was recorded in the investigation files was confidential under Swedish law, and it should not have been revealed 
uh, during the investigation phase. But if leaked to the media, the informant is protected against criminal charges by the Constitution, and no investigation on the leak may be initiated. Naturally, the far-reaching protection of informants to the media is for good and for bad. It really is for good when it comes to the issue of checks and balances in regard to the different heads of the Hydra that we call the state. But the source privilege also causes problems, and especially so when it comes to police investigations. As has been said, the confidentiality of information revealed during a police investigation is under the investigation phase privileged by law, but in reality, the content of a spectacular investigation is almost always, to a large extent, open to the public via leakage to the media. The, poli the police force is, and I'm sorry to say that, full of keen informers who do not understand to use the source privilege as it is intended, a protection for the prudent whistleblower. To share headline-breaking pieces of information with others, and especially journalists, seems to be a deep-rooted human flaw and difficult for the employer to thwart as long as it cannot be punished. But it is something that we have to live with in Sweden. As long as the rules are as they are, and still they probably should remain unchanged. One problem with the leakages as regards police investigation is that they can be defamatory to innocent people. It happens frequently that the person is initially suspected because somebody makes charges against him or her, but during the investigation the charges are found without merit. Meantime, news about the potential wrongdoing that may cause long time in jail is blown up big in the newspapers. In particular, the defamatory problem goes with celebrities. Assange may serve as an example. Had the investigation been carried out according to the book, nobody would have known about it until the case was closed or the prosecutor brought the charges to court. Thus, if Assange had not been a well-known person, he probably would have been interrogated the ordinary way. And thereafter, everything may well have ended with the prosecutor closing the case. The harm to Assange would then have been limited. But of course, it may also have ended in court. We don't know. Nevertheless, it is somewhat ironic that the man who many sees as an icon for transparency by publishing leaked information should experience a possible backlash caused by leakage of confidential information. Leakages can, of course, also be detrimental to the victims. Anna and Sophia have probably have hard times, and leakages uh, from police uh, also causes problems as regards the investigation. I already mentioned that. Notwithstanding such negative effects to the extensive protection of informers to the media, the common view in Sweden is that it's for more good and bad, and I agree with that. There are limits to the protection of sources. The first limit has to do with what is to regarded as protected media. In today's society, uh, uh, we have a lot of new medias. Are they protected the same way that old-fashioned newspapers are? I will leave that issue aside. Another limit has to do with the nature of the leakage. The borderline goes, somewhat simplified, with espionage and treason. I will later refer to the implication of this kind of limitations as regards the Assange case. It has been said that the successful conduct of international diplomacy and the maintenance of effective national defense require both confidentiality and secrecy. And this is, of course, perfectly true. There are good reasons for confidentiality and secrecy in many diverse situations. But on the other hand, Every human activity needs guardians. That is where whistleblowers and leakages come into picture. The tricky question is to strike a balance between the need of secrecy and the need of transparency. I think that a perfect balance is simply not achievable. But I also think that there are some tools which can be helpful. One is good ethics. And the other one is efficient checkout of the guardians. 
What is reported, and also what is not reported, should be critically scrutinized and possible motives questioned. It is also important to realize that the question cannot be narrowed down to the issue of freedom of the press. Leakages find their way to the public in many different ways. I don't have to say more than internet and social media. As for motives, WikiLeaks recently published some old documents relating to Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt. The very same minister that recently visited Australia and is reported to have then stated that Assange should confront the sex claims. Is there a connection? I don't know. But I think that even the Guardian's Guardian needs to be checked. Now about the legal actions in Sweden. After Anna had been heard by the police, Assange was arrested in absentia the very same day. When found, he was questioned once, August 30th, on accusation for sexual molestation by destroying the condom when having sex with Anna. He contested the charges and was released. The case was closed but reopened again. It happens now and then, and it's nothing extraordinary in itself. I don't know why the investigation continued, but I guess is that it was thought that Assange had not been properly heard about the accusations made by Sofia. Since Assange had left Sweden and did not show up voluntarily to be heard a second time, and it seems that his defender and the prosecutor had difficulties to make in contact, a European arrest warrant was issued by the Swedish authorities in December. The purpose was to enforce the Swedish police request for questioning in relation to alleged crimes. Based on that arrest warrant, Swedish authorities requested that Assange be extradited to Sweden from the UK, where he stayed. And that warrant was contested by Assange, but finally upheld by the Supreme Court last summer. Assange then turned to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and since June, he has stayed inside the embassy after being granted diplomatic asylum by Ecuador. It has been said that the British government firmly intends to extradite Assange to Sweden under the arrest warrant once he leaves the embassy. And it has been reported that the cost for surveillance so far amounts to more than three million British pounds, which I think is more than four million Australian dollars. According to Swedish newspapers, Assange thinks that he will not be given a fair trial in Sweden. It has also been reported that he considers Swedish criminal law to be exceptionally harsh when it comes to sexual crimes. I think Assange's statements, if he really has expressed himself as reported, call for some comments. Criminal proceedings as regards sexual crimes are normally initiated by the victim making a charge. Generally, the suspected perpetrator is heard very soon. If it is regarded as plausible that the suspect will be convicted and sentenced to two years or more in jail, he or she will be arrested by a summary court order. He or she may also be arrested for other reasons, for example, to enforce a police request for questioning in relation to an alleged crime. If there is a plausible cause, prosecution is mandatory. The prosecutor may not strike a deal with the suspect, and that goes for all crimes. The purpose is to protect against corruption and arbitrariness. The Swedish court system is similar to most European court systems. We have three levels. The Supreme Court selects which cases to hear on the basis of leave applications. We don't have uh, juries as they have in the United Kingdom, I believe, here. Uh, but we have some lay judges, but they have, they have minor influence on the outcome. Hearings are, of course, public. However, there are some exceptions to that in Australia when the integrity of a crime victim calls for secrecy. But the protection is normally restricted to secrecy as regards identity. The hearing as such is still open to public. Now, what about the harsh Swedish law on sex crimes? In Sweden, as in most developed countries, the attitude towards what should be regarded as a sexual crime have changed rather dramatically over the last decades. 
For example, not many decades ago, it was thought that rape could not take place between married couples. But that's not the law today. One important feature for the development when it comes to how sexual crimes should be regarded is that we are in the moment from criminalizing only forced sex in the direction of criminalizing sex without consent. However, as always, there is ongoing legislation as regards sexual crimes and what is presently proposed does not go all the way in the consent direction. But what is meant by consent? That question is not easily answered. The charges against Assange illustrate that. The Swedish Penal Code, of course, stipulates different kinds of sexual crimes. Of interest in this case are two types of crimes. The first one is rape, which is defined as sexual intercourse or a comparable sexual act with a person by violence or threats of illegal actions has forced up another person or by which he has made undue use of another person's helpless condition, such as inter alia, sleep, drunkenness, or other drug influence. The penalty is for at least two years, and at most six years. The second one is called sexual molestation. A person is liable for such a crime if he or she, by word or deed, offends another person in a way prone to violate his or her sense of sexual integrity. The penalty is a fine or imprisonment for at most two years. It should also be noticed that of importance in this case is the European Convention of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, as interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights. And there is a judgment called the Bulgaria Judgment of 2003. According to this judgment, the Convention obliges the Member State to criminalize every sexual act that has occurred without consent. That has some relevance inter alia because Swedish law generally is interpreted in the light of the Convention. It has been suggested by scholars in criminal law that the Bulgaria judgment calls for a concept that could be called the clear consent theory. The thinking is that any sexual deed or even an invitation should be regarded as not wanted and therefore offending the person addressed if he or she has not clearly made an informed approval of the action. Of course, there is a common sense and a good ethics in the clear consent theory. You should not trespass into another person's private sphere and sexuality is hot ground. The clear consent is, however, problematic. And it's very clear that the explicit consent is not always needed as the law presently is applied. So where are we when comes, we come to the accusations as regards Assange? I do not know anything regarding the matter beyond what you can find on the internet. That is not enough to base an opinion upon, and I will not venture a view anyhow. But two things should be said already at the outset. Firstly, as in any civilized society, a person should have the right to be regarded as innocent until a competent court has found otherwise. And secondly, where there are contradictory statements, you have to consider the burden of proof. The standard for conviction is that the late alleged crime has to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. I have no idea about the prob probable outcome in the Assange case, but hypothetically, what if a competent court holds that the girls have told the truth? For the sake of discussion, I now presume that in both cases the women consented to sex provided a condom was used. That means that the case is only about condoms, to wear or we are not. May the absence of a condom or a properly functioning condom be a legally relevant condition as to a necessary consent to have sex. I think when I start with looking up when looking up on the idea of condi conditional consent to have sex as a general concept, is it workable? One obvious conclusion is that not all conditions are legally relevant as where well 
as whether there is a necessary consent to have sex or not. I think that if you could request your partner to promise to marry you as a condition to have sex, still you will have to live with the possibility of being disappointed. And that leads to one potential criteria, a condition that a partner shall do something or shall not do it in the future should be presumed to be irrelevant in the context of what shall be regarded as a sexual crime. To what extent is legally binding from a contractual point of view, that is another question. Another situation is that an approval is conditioned up some actual circumstance. For example, one partner asks the other if he or she has tested negative as regards HIV in the near past. The partner lies and says yes. The lie is not about the test as such, but about the result of it. The test was positive. This is, of course, not acceptable. Having sex when you have HIV without telling your partner has also, by Swedish courts, been considered as an assault and battery against the partner. But it has not in Sweden been tried whether it is a sexual crime because a conditional consent was not met. Now, what about the Assange case? Again, on the hypothesis that what the women have told the police will be fully found, proven by the court, I simply don't know. It should be said that as regards the issue of arrest, two courts, first and second instance, have held that there is a probable cause as regards sexual molestation. But on the other hand, probable cause is a lower standard than beyond reasonable doubt. It has been reported in the Swedish newspapers that Assange fears that an extradition to Sweden may, re uh, that fears that an extradition to Sweden may result in his subsequent extradition to the United States to face charges there. It has also been reported that Assange thinks that he may be sentenced to death if convicted. It is fascinating how the Assange case offers possibilities of sharp turns when it comes to topics to be discussed. From, on the one hand, whether lies about condoms can result in a sexual crime, to, on the other hand, the question if telling the truth by publishing classified information can amount to a crime permitting extradition to the state that claims having been harmed. According to the Swedish Act on Extradition for Criminal Offences, a person present in Sweden who in a foreign state is suspected of an act that is punishable there may be extradited to that state. Extradition is permitted provided the offense for, what, for which extradition is requested is equivalent to a crime punishable under Swedish law by the imprisonment for at least one year. Thus, extradition requires, firstly, an offense punishable under the law of both countries, dual criminality. And secondly, that the offense is of a certain degree of seriousness. But there are also other restrictions. Extradition may not be granted for military or political offences. Nor may extradition be granted if there is a reason to fear that the person whose extradition is requested runs the risk of being subjected to persecution, threatening his or her life or freedom, or is serious in any other respect. Nor may extradition be granted if it will be contrary to fundamental humanitarian principles. It should also be noted that extradition must not violate Sweden's obligation under the European Convention. However, according to bilateral or multilateral treaties and other legal instruments, extradition can take place on more or less lenient legal grounds. Between members of the European Union, the European Arrest Warrant requires each national judicial authority to recognize ipso facto and with a minimum of formalities, request for the surrender of a person made by the judicial authority of another member state. That is why the court in the UK did not really try the merits of the Swedish arrest as regards Assange. If a person whose extradition is requested opposes extradition, it falls to the Supreme Court to examine whether extradition can be legally granted on the condition laid down by law. The Supreme Court then delivers its opinion to the government for use in its examination of the case. If the Supreme Court holds 
that there is any legal impediment to extradition, the government is not allowed to approve the request. The government may, however, refuse extradition even if the Supreme Court has not declared against it. The reason for that is basically a variation of the blame game. It's very convenient for the government to declare that the request for extradition must be denied because the Supreme Court has ordered so. That's an easy answer to give to another state. We have some specifics when it regards extradition to the United States because uh, 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 a treaty between Sweden and, and uh, the US. I will here leave the technicalities aside. There are, in fact, several instruments. But as a summarization, the following is of special interest in this case. The principle of dual criminality is applicable. In respect of extraditable offense committed outside the territorial jurisdiction of Sweden, extradition shall be granted only if Swedish courts would be competent to exercise jurisdiction in similar circumstances. Extradition shall not be granted when the offence is purely military. Extradition shall not be granted if the offence in Sweden is regarded as political or connected with a political offence. Now, does Assange face a risk of being extradited? I don't know what crime, if any, Assange's involvement in the publishing of military or diplomatic documents would amount to as regards the law of the United States. I have, however, somewhere read that Assange may be charged for communic communicating national defenses, defense information to an unauthorized source and aiding the enemy. As I understand it, it is about espionage or treason. Now, that raises some interesting questions. The first question is, do we have an equivalent criminalization in Sweden? Yes, of course. But I think that the question rather should be put in this way. Is offense for which extradition is requested a crime under Swedish law? Well, that could be debated. What is classified under US law is probably not classified under Swedish law. And enemies to the US may not be enemies to Sweden. Thus the question is, if the principle of dual criminality shall be applied based on actual circumstances, documents classified under US rules and aiding US enemies, or on an equivalent Swedish situation, documents classified under Swedish rules and aiding Swedish enemies. Further, what about the source privilege? Under Swedish law, it is, as has been mentioned, with some exception, not punishable to leak classified information to the media. There is, however, an exception as regards Swedish military secrets. Is the source privilege applicable when it comes to extradition? Yes, probably. If, for example, a leakage to the press of a business secret in another jurisdiction, jurisdiction is regarded as a crime, and extradition from Sweden is sought, the application should be denied, notwithstanding such leakage in general is criminalized in Sweden, because you may leak to a journalist. The source privilege takes over here. But what about foreign military secrets? Is exception to the source privilege as regards military secrets applicable to only Swedish secrets, or, in an extradition case, also to military secrets of a foreign state? There are further questions. Do you leak information to the enemy in a legal sense when you leak it to the world at large? It could also be asked if the offense is purely military or to be regarded as political. All those questions could be put, but I restrict myself to these queries, and I put them to you for your consideration. It is obvious that the globalization demands well-organized and far-reaching cooperation between states in order to efficiently fight cross-border crimes. But cooperation means that you must in large measure trust authorities in other jurisdictions. 
These are sensitive issues. They concern the rule of law. During my years as a practicing lawyer, I learned to mistrust any organization, including the state. When people come together and think of themselves as united with a special task or goal, astonishing dynamics can cause strange things to happen. You know it all. Thus, I think that one should not presume that the state or any part of it is always good. If anything should be presumed at all, it is to the contrary. If it, it is sometimes necessary to view the different authorities of the state as heads of the vicious hydra. You have to be attentive and to be prepared to fight such evil that a misled intent to do well can result in. Now, if a foreign authority wants anything, you, you and I as a judge should be yet more aware. Why? Not because other states are even more wicked than your own. I guess they are more or less the same everywhere, at least in the Western world. But because when a state acts outside its borders, the presumption is plainly put that it shall mind its own business. As regards extradition, I think especially so when it comes to crimes that is not directed against individuals, but against the state. Generally, in my opinion, a state that claims to have been offended and therefore applies for extradition uh, of the purported, purported persecutor shall not be helped out. This is also to a certain extent reflected in the Swedish legal legislation, including the agreements between the USA and Sweden, in that extradition shall not be granted when the alleged crimes is military or political in nature. Back to Assange. I think it is a mess. And as always, whether there is a mess, the question is, how did it happen? Could it have been prevented? Basically, I think there are some misunderstandings, especially when it comes to the issue of extradition. I have difficulties to understand why, Swedish, why the Swedish treaty with the US that works both ways should differ in any significant way from the corresponding rules in any other member state in the EU. I also think that the misunderstandings have been aggravated because of the combination of the circumstances. It is about a person as famous and intriguing as a rock and roll star, and it's about sex. The only missing ingredient is drugs. And on the top of that, the media focus. Anything what media covers may defeat ordinary logic. If there is a good story to report, it will be reported and possibly made even better. And the proved story will nourish variants of the story and so on. And then the storytelling and the possible new media reports became a part which needs to be considered when further decisions are to be taken. Finally, has justice a price? Justice must not only be done, it must also be seen to be done. You all know those words. They are well known and they are very wise. But what actually happens may not be how people perceive and view it. And the ultimate basis of justice is, whether we like it or not, common people's acceptance. There can be no lasting law but that which is generally accepted. And that poses a question. What impact has the Assange case had as a god Swedish common people's beliefs in the rule of law? Well, it may depend on from where you see it. As regards the Swedish perspective, I think that the Assange case is problematic when it comes to common people's belief in the legal system. Many think that Assange is mocking and ridiculing the justice, and that he gets away with it. Other things that the prosecutor acts with unnecessary prestige and when not hearing Assange in London. The distrust in the legal system that the Assange case causes is underpinned by the efforts and costs of it. As has been mentioned, Swedish newspapers have reported that the cost of surveillance of the embassy of Ecuador now amounts to over three million British pounds. Money that could and should 
have been used for a better cause. Then who is to blame? Assange? The prosecutor? Anybody else? Well, it's not up to me to decide. But there is a limit to everything. I've heard people saying, forget about it, let him go. Or at least interrogate him in London. It's wrong, but it's better than I told you. Perhaps it ought to be solved practically. Perhaps a certain price for justice is to accept that justice cannot always be perfect or enforced in a perfect way. I think that is worth a discussion. At the end of the day, many years from now, I think that Assange will not even in Sweden be so much associated with his efforts to escape the laws of Sweden. He will be thought of as a person who may publish some pieces of classified information to the benefit of mankind. Crimes against humanity, <coughs> as a helicopter shooting seems to be, need to, make, need to be made known. The good made by leakages of such information cannot be underestimated. It should never be a crime to make known crime of a state. But leakage of that kind need not only facilitators like Assange, they also need consensus, brave men and women. Let us not forget about Bradley Manning. Let us hope and pray that he will have a fair trial and a balanced sentence. I cannot judge to what extent leakage of all these documents were ethically defendable. It may well was not. But I strongly hold that a part of leakage was good to the society and should not be punished. Thank you for listening.